20th century in America. For some, it was the best of times. For others, the worst of times. It was a time of great technological achievement, but it was also a time in which we used technology to bring unprecedented violence and bloodshed to the world. It was a time of wealth and prosperity, and it was a time of hardship and sorrow. It was a time when great progress was made for individual rights and freedom, but it was also a time of oppression and hatred. It was a time quite unlike any other. This is the story of that time. America slipped into the 20th century amidst an atmosphere of cautious optimism. The United States defeated Spain in what Theodore Roosevelt called a splendid little war over a period of 10 weeks in 1898, and under the terms of the Treaty of Paris took possession of Cuba, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Cuba was soon granted its independence, but the situation in the Pacific was a bit more complicated. Nationalist forces in the Philippine Islands had been fighting a war for independence against the Spanish since 1896. When American forces arrived, they were encouraged to ally with the United States by what they considered a promise of independence once Spain had been defeated. However, the leaders of the so-called First Philippine Republic were unhappy with the terms of the peace treaty and declared war against the United States in June 1899. Although the conflict was declared officially over on the 4th of July, 1902, sporadic fighting continued for another 10 years. With these acquisitions and that of Hawaii, which was annexed in 1898, in spite of Oklahoma opposition, the United States was officially a colonial power. On the home front, the presidential election in 1900 was, for the most part, a repeat of the one held four years before. At the Republican convention in June, President William McKinley was nominated for a second term. Since Vice President Garrett Hobart had died the year before, he chose former New York governor and war hero Theodore Roosevelt as his running mate. When the Democrats gathered in Kansas City the following month, they once again nominated William Jennings Bryan, a populist lawyer and former congressman from Nebraska. Bryan also got the endorsement for a second time of the fusion populace after that party split into opposing factions earlier in the spring. During the campaign, McKinley and Roosevelt capitalized on the booming economy with the slogan, Four More Years of the Full Dinner Pail. In an attempt to match Bryan's barnstorming approach, Roosevelt swept across the nation, making almost 500 stops in 23 states, while McKinley campaigned once again from his front porch in Ohio. In many of those speeches, Roosevelt sang the praises of the recent war and presented the conflict as a crusade to free the people of Cuba and the Philippines from Spanish tyranny. For his part, Bryan continued his populist plea for free silver and added anti-imperialist rhetoric to the mix, claiming that the war simply replaced the Spanish tyranny with an American one. In the end, economic prosperity and public approval of the Spanish war brought victory for the McKinley-Roosevelt ticket. The Republican ticket won 51% of the popular vote and 292 electoral votes from 28 states. Following his inauguration on the 4th of March, 1901, McKinley and his wife left the White House and embarked upon a six-week tour of the nation to rally public support for a second-term agenda, which included a proposal to reduce tariffs to stimulate international trade. But he would have little time to make his wishes known. On the 5th of September, while receiving visitors to the Temple of Music at the Pan American Exposition at Buffalo, New York, the President was approached by a man with a handgun concealed under a handkerchief. Leon Shulkosh, a self-proclaimed anarchist, shot McKinley twice in the abdomen before he was subdued by bystanders. As he lay on the floor of the exhibit hall, the President asked that his assailant not be injured by the crowd. Although McKinley's condition initially improved in the days following the shooting, undetected gangrene soon set in, and he died at a quarter past two on the morning of September 14th. Theodore Roosevelt rushed to Buffalo to be sworn in as the nation's 26th president. The body of the slain president was first taken to Buffalo City Hall, where thousands of mourners filed past the casket to pay their respects. 
Crowds gathered around the tracks as the funeral train made its way first to Washington, where McKinley lay in state at the Capitol, and then to Canton, Ohio, where he was buried at West Lawn Cemetery. In a stunning example of swift justice, Shulkosh was tried just nine days after the president's death and was executed the following month. Despite the violence and tragedy, Americans had plenty to be happy and optimistic about in the first decade of the new century. New power plants lit up the streets and brought modern technology to an ever-increasing number of American homes and businesses. By 1910, more than 10% of American homes had electric service, mostly in urban areas. And this power was not just used for lights, but to make life easier in many ways. Brooms and sweepers were replaced by electric vacuum cleaners, tubs and washboards by washing machines. Telephone exchanges sprang up across the nation, boosting the number of subscribers to Bell System from 600,000 in 1900 to nearly 6 million by the end of the decade. People who could afford to pay $6 a month for service could visit with a friend across town, order groceries, or call for help without leaving their homes. There were more automobiles on the streets, but in a time when the average American worker made less than $700 a year, relatively few could afford to buy them. At this time, automobiles were built one at a time, by hand, so much of the cost of a new car was for labor. In the first half of the decade, it was hard to find a decent model for less than $1,000, but by 1908, you could pick up this Ford for less than an average man's yearly pay, but you had to have the money up front. There were no car loans or installment payments in this day. But in spite of the cost, and the fact that these early cars required frequent repairs, America fell in love with the horseless carriage. Young John Maysteel has an old mobile. He loves a dear little girl. She is the queen of his gas machine. She has his heart in a whirl. Now when they go for a spin, you know, she tries to land the auto. So he lets her steer while he gets her ear and whispers soft and low. There were significant improvements in other forms of transportation as well. Electric trolleys began to replace horse cars in most large cities during the last 20 years of the 19th century. By 1900, lines were extended in outlying areas, giving rise to new residential communities called streetcar suburbs. In New York, commuting from uptown got a lot more convenient in 1904 when the city's first subway line opened from City Hall to Harlem. It was extremely popular. On opening day, more than 100,000 people showed up to take their first ride. Availability of jobs, better working conditions, and rising pay allowed many American families to move into the middle class during this first decade of the 20th century. The desire to move into better neighborhoods led to an increase in the construction of housing, which fed even greater economic growth. With more people making more money, there was more money to spend. For city dwellers, this meant a wide choice of downtown department stores and shopping emporiums, offering everything from the latest fashion to household goods and toys. For the 60% of Americans who lived in rural areas, there was the iconic Sears Roebuck catalog. Farmers and villagers alike could mail order clothing, furniture, farm equipment, musical instruments, firearms, and practically anything else you could imagine. Do you need a new car? Sears had that one covered as well. For less than $400, you could order a complete chain-driven motor buggy capable of speeds up to 25 miles per hour. How about a house? Just over $1,000 would buy this five-bedroom cottage kit. Plans and materials included and ready to build on your land. It's too bad we don't have that opportunity today. When the work was done, Americans in the early 20th century, just like today, liked to slip out for a little fun and recreation. For a nickel, you could check out the latest motion pictures at one of the many theaters that could be found in any decent-sized city or town. Cinema was still a novelty, and features like the great train robbery were very popular at the time. Advertisements at the time declared the film to be absolutely the superior of any motion picture ever made. 
Perhaps your idea of fun was to spend an afternoon at the ballpark. The sport dubbed America's pastime came of age during this first decade of the new century, bringing fame to players like Honest Wagner, Ty Cobb, and Willie Keaton. For a more restful diversion, there were band concerts and picnics in the local park, but Big Adventure could be found at any of the popular amusement parks and resorts across the nation. Places with names like Chester Park, Euclid Lake, Paradise Park, and White City drew thousands of visitors on any given summer weekend. There were roller coasters, slide shows, boat rides, and much more. But the king of them all was Coney Island in Brooklyn, New York. The name Coney Island actually refers to the former island-turned-peninsula upon which three major theme parks and many smaller attractions were located. Luna Park, Dreamland, and Steeplechase Park attracted thousands of visitors during the decade and set the standard for amusement parks for the next 40 years. Compared to today's electronic-laden theme parks, Coney Island might not seem like much, but in its day, it was like a trip to another world. You could experience the Great Galveston Flood of 1900, ride through Dragon's Gorge, an indoor roller coaster featuring rocks, caverns, and waterfalls, or visit Lilliputia, a small-scale city inhabited by a community of little people. Whether you strolled the avenue, rode the rides, or hit the beach, Coney Island was a great place to spend a pleasant summer day. In the good old summertime, in the good old In the spring of 1904, the place to be was the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, known to everybody as the St. Louis World's Fair. It was the largest fair ever, with 1,500 buildings spread over a 1,200-acre site. It took two years to build even though almost all of the buildings were made of a mixture of plaster of Paris and hemp fibers and expected to last only a couple of years. 62 foreign nations, the federal government, and 43 states hosted exhibits. As a bonus, the fair also hosted the Summer Olympics that year. The main exhibits were housed in 12 large buildings dubbed palaces, each dedicated to a specific theme such as education, technology, or transportation. Within the palaces, exhibits were designed to demonstrate a process rather than simply display a collection of items and artifacts. For example, the telegraph exhibit featured a working instrument and a telegraph operator. The Cliff Dwellers attraction included 12 buildings and more than 300 Native American performers most of them from the Pueblo communities of the Rio Grande Valley in New Mexico. Visitors would climb a narrow trail, either on foot or by burro, where they would view native rituals, dances, and traditional crafts. There was an exhibit hall where 25 premature babies were on display, accompanied by a team of lecturers who would explain how modern technology could give sickly infants a fighting chance for survival. Many of the more popular attractions were along a wide, mile-long avenue called the Pike. This was where the traditional features, such as a Ferris wheel, shoot the shoots, and food concessions were located, but it was also the scene of more interesting offerings as well. Visitors to the hereafter journeyed across the River of Death to the Throne Room of Satan, but were rewarded by a glimpse of paradise at the end. Cummins' Wild West show featured a cast of more than 800 actors, cowboys, and Indians, recreating a wide variety of western scenes. There were many more attractions, just to list them would take hours. Here are some highlights through the eyes of those who were there. Meet me in St. Louis, Louis, meet me at the fair. Don't tell me the lights are shining any place but there. We will dance the hoochie coochie. I will be your tootsie wootsie if you will meet me in St. Louis, Louis. Meet me at the fair. President Roosevelt.
riding a wave of popularity due to his ambitious and charming personality, not to mention his efforts to break up a number of monopolistic trusts, easily defeated Democratic challenger Alton B. Parker in the 1904 election. After his inauguration the following March, he would achieve even greater fame by supporting the Pure Food and Drug Act and earning the Nobel Peace Prize for helping to settle the war between Russia and Japan. He declined to run for another term in 1908, throwing his support behind William Howard Taft, who was victorious in the election that fall over William Jennings Bryan, who was making his third try for the White House. Three weeks after leaving office, Roosevelt embarked upon an African safari where he and his companions killed or trapped more than 10,000 animals. Disaster struck San Francisco early on the morning of April 18, 1906, when a massive earthquake hit. As bad as the damage from the quake was, soon a number of fires broke out across the city, destroying more than 25,000 buildings over a four-day period. An estimated 3,000 people lost their lives, and 300,000 were left homeless, about 70% of the population. After the fires died out, thousands were reduced to living on the streets in makeshift huts and tents while an effort was made to clear away the rubble. In the end, the determined citizens of San Francisco persevered, and a new modern city soon arose from the ashes of the old. Not all Americans were happy, healthy, or prosperous in these first years of the new century. In New York, there were often families of eight or more living in crowded tenement apartments. In many neighborhoods, substandard housing was the rule rather than the exception. Ten percent of American babies died before their first birthday, and half of all American children lived in poverty. Child labor was still a major issue, although new laws enacted during this time drastically reduced the number of children employed in factories and other dangerous pursuits. Because of the increased availability of jobs and a rise in the standard of living, some families were able to pull themselves into the middle class, while others were doomed to struggle on with no hope of ever realizing the American dream. As we look back across the span of years that brought America into the 20th century, we see a time of great change. The slow-paced world where travel was on foot or by horse and most labor was by hand was passing away and, in its place, came an exciting new world filled with the promise of wonderful new technologies, more comfortable lives, and a brighter future in which anything was possible. It was a time like no other.